So when you unpack what the legends did, what you discover is that legends are different, not better. Welcome to The Art of Charm. I'm Jordan Harbinger, and as always, I'm here with producer Jason DeFilippo. On this episode, we'll be talking with my friend Christopher Lockhead. He's the host of the Legends and Losers podcast and co-author of Play Bigger. This guy's been running businesses, and he's a retired Silicon Valley three-time public company CMO, chief marketing officer, and dorks like me call him the godfather of category design. What that means, we'll talk about in a bit. But today, we'll discuss the surprising fact that entrepreneurship is actually at an all-time low in America and why that might be, and we'll uncover how to design and dominate your own category. Every legendary product, service, or brand exists because an innovator got product, company, and category right at the right time. We'll also discuss designing what Christopher calls a legendary life. Cheesy or not, some people think that life is what happens to you, like the weather, and legendary folks proactively design each and every component of their life, and we'll get into how this applies to you, whether you're an entrepreneur, a business owner, or working your way up the ladder in a corporate career. Don't forget, we have a worksheet for today's episode so you can make sure you solidify your understanding of the key takeaways here from Chris Lockhead. That link is in the show notes at theartofcharm.com slash podcast. Now, let's hear from Chris Lockhead. Chris, thanks for coming on the show, man. I know we uh, we had a little bit of a back and forth, and the reason behind my resistance initially is we don't normally talk about business-focused topics or business-specific topics on the show, but something that really did hook me here was initially something that I did not believe, which is your claim, or the claim, that I saw in our pre-show chat here, which is that entrepreneurship is at an all-time low in America. I cannot believe this, and it turns out you're right, spoiler alert, but I cannot believe this because when I go online, every ad that I see is make money at home, make money online, start your own business. I'm at all these conferences, and some of this is just the bias of my focus, right? I'm surrounded by entrepreneurs, I'm surrounded by business people, all the time, they're in my inbox, they're in my real life. How can it be that entrepreneurship is at an all-time low in America when it seems like we can't escape it online? I know it's an incredibly hard thing to believe. This is not my data or research, so I should let you know that. In March of 2016, I saw an article in the Wall Street Journal and the headline says, The Crisis in American Entrepreneurship. And I, like you, you know, I spent 21 years living in Silicon Valley. I live close to Silicon Valley now in Santa Cruz. And I saw this and I thought, what are you talking about? This is not the case to your point. And I read it. And according to new research from the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, we are at the lowest level in, in recorded American entrepreneurship and more companies die every week in the USA than are started. That is shocking to me. Although I just spoke with a friend of mine who runs a lot of retreats for well-to-do entrepreneurs. And he said that one of the most disheartening things about his new branch of the business, because he started teaching newbies, not brand new, but you know, first three years types of entrepreneurs and business owners, he said he's getting out of it because it's bringing him down so much. Not that those people are hard to teach, not that there's less potential today, but the fact is that even when he does his job, absolute A plus home run, something like 95 to 99% of the people in any given class are going to fail within a few years. Surprise, business is hard. So it doesn't surprise me that a lot of businesses are closing, but it seems like this is something that is a problem that either we cannot fix because them's the breaks, or that there's such a cookie cutter idea of what starting a business and what entrepreneurship is that we're all doing it wrong and a lot of the people who are getting into the game aren't thinking about it in the right way. I think, you know, there's a lot of factors that are pointed to in the MIT research. One of them, by way of example, is the cost of higher education. So as you well know, you come out of school today and you can have many tens of thousands and in some cases hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of debt that takes 20 plus years. And so because that has gone up so much over the last 25 years or so, millennials are coming out of school and they need a job because they need to pay off these loans. So that's part of it. You know, the other part of it, I wonder, is it cultural? Is there something about people today in America and maybe some younger people where they might read all the stuff that you and I read, but for whatever reason, they don't go for it as entrepreneurs? You know, that's a head scratcher. And the third thing that's a real head scratcher for me is if you look at the cost of starting a business today versus even 15 years ago, it's so much cheaper, Jordan. 
to think that you could just plug into the infrastructure that Amazon.com uses and, you know, scale your business as required and sort of only pay for what you use, you know, those kinds of concepts are revolutionary and they didn't exist. And so, you know, you could put up a world-class website for almost nothing today, et cetera, et cetera. And so the cost of building a business or starting a business has never been lower. And yet here we sit. You know, that makes sense. Uh, 11 years ago, when we first started The Art of Charm, I think we rented some server space from GoDaddy, which is where we would bought our domain, which by the way, was $150 a year back then. Now is probably $7 if you don't use any coupon codes. And we needed a server because we had maxed out our shared server with GoDaddy and they wanted just tens of thousands of dollars for dedicated servers that were maintained by them. It was unbelievable. So we found a friend of ours who is a, client of The Art of Charm in the early, early days, and he said, oh, I've got a solution. I, I do this all the time at work. I'm gonna find you a used server. So we bought one of those, I think it was like 13 grand, and he said, look, I'm gonna keep this in my office. My office is cooled, it's an IT company. I need you to pay me for maintaining it where I need to call in other experts, but I'll do my part for free, and my boss won't care that I have a personal server at work because he worked in an awesome, cool place. And I remember, He's like, yeah, my boss just wants you to pay for your bandwidth. And that internet connection there was so expensive because it was probably half as fast as your home internet connection is now, but it was shared with all these different servers and you had to pay. You had to pay for this T1 line that went into this building. And so our first foray into real enterprise level stuff cost the company around twenty twenty five thousand dollars $25,000. Now you can go get the exact same thing, it'll be faster, more reliable, managed by a real professional, and it's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 bucks a month. Yeah, I mean, if you, you just think about how powerful things like Box, Dropbox, Ignite, those kinds of things are. I mean, we used to pay many thousands of dollars a month just for storage, and you don't have to do that anymore. And so all that stuff has gone away. The other big problem that I see, Jordan, is a lot of the advice to entrepreneurs today is frankly wrong and kind of bullshit. And the two biggest ones that I hear are, number one, follow your passion, and number two, hustle, hustle, hustle. Telling entrepreneurs to follow their passion and to hustle, hustle, hustle is not only stupid, but almost criminal because... First of all, your passion might not connect to solving any problem that anybody cares about. You know, my friend uh, Tushar gave me a 1981 Atari, and I'm passionate about playing Space Invaders. I don't know what that means about my career, but follow your passion doesn't necessarily connect to anything. We have to design either a career or a company that is centered around a big problem and then how we can uniquely, and I'm going to use this word on purpose and in a different way, solve that problem. And so follow your passion, I think, is dumb advice. The other reason hustle is dumb advice is for my book, we did this research and we looked at the percentage of value created as measured by market capitalization that goes to the leader in tech market categories. And it turns out that number is 76%. And so what I'm saying is, whether we like it or not, we do live in a winner-take-all world at least in tech markets, and more and more market categories behave like tech categories, one company takes the vast majority of the economics. And so if you're hustling in a category that's dominated by a category king that has 76% of the economics, at best, you're playing for a quarter of what is available in that category. And so those two pieces of advice are the ones that I hear particularly told to young entrepreneurs all the time. And it's just shitty advice. Yeah, I hear this a lot. And I've we've riffed on the you listen to the show, so you've heard us just slam many times that particular trope, which is follow your passion because it's survivorship bias. You've heard somebody say follow your passion because they have a microphone and they're talking in front of a room full of young people or entrepreneurs or just new entrepreneurs in general, but that's they're the one percent or the one hundredth of one percent that went, Oh, I guess I followed my passion. And everybody else who followed their passion followed it straight into their mom's basement. And now you're hearing that advice from them because they don't want to say, yeah, you know, what happened was 8,000 boring things that happened over the last 15 to 20 years, dot, 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 Mark Cuban, right? In addition to tremendous amounts of luck, opportunity, things that worked out, trial and error, but none of that stuff is sexy. I'm at a commencement speech, follow your dreams. How about that? And everyone goes, yay, yeah, that's yeah. what I wanted to hear because I have an idea and I'm married to it, 
I didn't really look into it that much. I just want it to be right because being right is fun and it validates what I've done so far and that's what I want. I want to feel good after hearing this. I don't want to go, oh crap, I've got to pivot and it's going to be really hard and I kind of have to start over after 10 years, right? Well, yeah, and the worst part about it is you could totally destroy your love of your passion. How many times have you heard the story of, you know, a great chef who opens a restaurant and the res restaurant doesn't work and now she hates cooking and she's got, you know, $350,000 worth of debt. And so there's a lot of people who take their passion, turn it into their profession and F it up. And so those things are not germane to can I build a legendary business or for that matter, a legendary career. There's got to be some famous saying about the best way to kill a hobby is to turn it into a business, right? I mean, that sounds like it's some sort of combination of Mark Twain and, I don't know, Seth Godin, right? Maybe Jordan Harbinger. <laughs> yeah, it really is. The best way to kill something you enjoy is to turn it into your job. And I think a lot of people don't really understand that. We've gotten lucky here where I love to do the show so much and Jason loves the production stuff so much that it's almost impossible to ruin it. I can think of a few ways in which we could still do it, but it's very, very difficult. But there were absolutely many, many times in my career here at AOC, and Jason's heard me mention this before, we call it the post office days because I would wake up in the morning and say, I should just get a job at the post office because at least those people have an end to the day and it just looks easier than what I'm doing now. And I was passing construction workers working outside in the freaking snow in Michigan, and I would go, well, you know, at least they know that they're gonna be paid, and at least they know what they're gonna be doing tomorrow, and that's not a good feeling, right? That's not passion. That's me going, wow, I ruined this thing I love because it's hard now, and I associate it with the most stressful thing in my entire life at the moment. Yeah, terrible, terrible outcome on all fronts, but other than that, it's fantastic advice. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, other than that, follow your passion, follow your dreams. Okay, so to put a, a little bit of a bow on the hustle part, though, what is it about that that you don't like? Because I understand you can't just hustle your way to the top, and like you said, you're gonna hustle, 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 and at best, you'll get 25% of the market that another niche has, but people are going, great, online video is what I wanna do, 25% of that market is 25 million bucks, sounds good to me, buddy. Let's just think about that. So you're going to start off knowing full well that at best, a quarter of the market's available to you. And here's the real thing. The vast majority of entrepreneurs, innovators of any kind, and for that kind, and for that matter, people in their careers, we make an unconscious, unquestioned, unexamined, untalked about decision to do the following. I am going to compete in an existing market category with a strategy called I'm better than everyone else. The I being me, is my career, me as a solopreneur, me as a small business, or me as the guy trying to create the next Facebook. And so that's what we've been taught. We've been taught, whether it's in life or in business, that the way you win is you play a better strategy in an existing game. And the key is to be the best. Well, it turns out that strategy is 180 degrees wrong if you want to build a legendary career or a legendary business. And so when you unpack what the legends did, what you discover is that legends are different, not better. And I'll give you a simple example. A lot of people, of course, know who Pablo Picasso is. Yeah, the drug smuggler. Just kidding. <laughs> no, continue. Yeah, there wasn't there a great movie about how yeah. Pablo pa Picasso? Yeah, Narcos. It's yeah. Like Narcos on Netflix, Pablo, Pablo Picasso. Yeah. So if you look at Picasso, when he starts his career, he's painting, you know, landscapes and sunsets and, you know, nice shit like other people do. And it's not until he starts to use bright colors and cubes and take the boob and stick it on top of the head and take the foot and stick it in the mouth and do all the stuff that he did. And when he first started to paint that way, People looked at it and said, well, that's clearly the work of a drunken six-year-old. And he said, no, that's where you're wrong. It's a new category of art called cubism. And so my point is, when Picasso was playing a better game, nobody even knew he was a painter. And when he did something, and I'm going to use this word on purpose, different, and then he named that different something, and then he went further, he taught the world how to think about this new kind of art, cubism, the way he did. 
And when the world accepted Cubism, he wasn't another painter. He was the first Cubist painter. And so my question for people is, who would you rather be, Pablo or the 87th Cubist painter in the world? You're listening to The Art of Charm with Jordan Harbinger and his guest, Chris Lockhead. We'll get right back to the show after these important announcements. This episode is sponsored in part by HostGator. Social networks are always changing. All that work you put into cultivating your walled garden on Facebook could end up a weed-infested MySpace before you know it, and then back to square one. That's where you are. But if you own your own website, you've got it made in the shade. And that's why here at AOC, we recommend getting your website on HostGator. HostGator includes a ton of tools and guarantees with each hosting plan. It's really easy for small businesses and individuals, freelancers, et cetera, to set it up. There's no data cap, which means if you get a picture that gets hosted on Reddit, you don't end up having to pay $1,000 for hosting it. There's a free website builder. There's unlimited email addresses, which, by the way, you usually have to pay like 10 bucks a month for. Ridiculous. There's also 24-7, 365 tech support. So if you're not satisfied, of course, cancel within 45 for a full refund. Get all that by going to hostgator.com slash charm. And for being a part of the AOC family, HostGator is gonna give you 50% off their packages for new users. So hostgator.com slash charm, take advantage of that discount there and send me your website if you create one. We've had a lot of people sending in their sites. We throw a little feedback your way. Support for this podcast and the following message comes from Amica Insurance. We are living in the age of the discerning shopper when savvy consumers increasingly favor brands that value authenticity, ethics, and a great shopping experience. Amica is committed to being a company people trust. Visit meetamica.com slash Forbes and find out why 95% of Amica customers with combined auto and home policies stay with them. That's meetamica.com slash Forbes to find out more about Amica Insurance. Hey, whether this is your first or 500th episode of The Art of Charm, we're glad to have you with us and we'd love to send you some of our most popular episodes and the AOC Toolbox. The toolbox is where we study the science of people. We get into concepts like reading body language and nonverbal communication, the sciences of attraction and charisma, negotiation techniques, social engineering, networking and influence strategies, persuasion tactics, and all that we teach here on the show and at our live programs at The Art of Charm. So be sure to check out the toolbox at theartofcharm.com slash toolbox. And don't forget, we have a worksheet for today's episode. This worksheet will help make sure you solidify your understanding of all the key takeaways here from Chris Lockhead. That link is in the show notes at theartofcharm.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening and supporting The Art of Charm. Now let's get back to Jordan and Chris. Right, so we have to define our own category. And this makes a lot of sense in terms of wanting to dominate a particular space. Of course, you can dominate a space that you create, but doesn't everyone kind of do this where they go, no, 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 it's like, I'm like Tim Ferriss, only I'm female, I'm retired from another career, so it's totally different. And it's like, well, not really, because you're sort of saying that the only differentiation is that you're older and a different gender. What's the difference between a new space and you just sort of painting yourself a slight shade of gray differently than everyone else in the same space? That's such a great question. And, you know, the answer is, does the market agree with you ultimately about what the difference is? So for example, five hour energy, when that product comes out, they don't position it as better Gatorade. Everything about it is different from the packaging to the pricing to the taste. And most importantly, what they call it. They don't do a Pepsi challenge with Coke versus Pepsi against Red Bull. They don't do any of that shit. They say it's not an energy drink, it's an energy shot. And so by doing everything in a different way, they teach the world how to think about a problem called how do I pet myself up in a very unique way. And it's all predicated on an insight that says, just because I'm tired doesn't mean I'm thirsty. And so I give you this small can. And so by teaching the world why an energy shot is different than an energy drink, they reframe the way the world thinks about a problem. What do I take when I need a little pick-me-up? And as a result, they don't ask customers to compare the product against a Red Bull or, or a Gatorade. They introduce it as a completely new thing. And so everything that comes after that then gets compared to that. And so that's what ultimately what we're trying to do. Is there a differentiator 
particularly one that's associated with a problem that we can put our finger on and make that problem a big one for our customer or our employer if we're thinking about our career. And the bigger the problem, the more time, money, and energy people will use to solve that problem. And if you kind of identify a new problem or take an existing problem and reframe it in a powerful way, then all of a sudden you're positioned as as unique. This is my Shark Tank business expertise talking here. But don't we then run into the problem that we hear about all the time when those deals get rejected, which is, well, now you've got to educate the market. Now you've got to tell everybody about this new thing that you're doing and they don't know what it is, and that's going to be a huge problem. That's where they're wrong. That's what every legendary business and that's what every legendary career has done. Think about your favorite musicians for the most part. Many of them are natural category designers. My favorite band is the Ramones. Well, when the Ramones came out, Led Zeppelin was one of the most popular bands in the world and very technical bands like Rush and Yes and all this, you know, Peter Frampton, all these insanely talented musicians. These were four guys who made a noise. And when people first heard them, they said, that's garbage. And ultimately, what they said is, no, that's where you're wrong. You can't listen to the Ramones the same way you listen to Led Zeppelin. You need a different set of ears, right? Because we're punk rock. And the minute the world gets punk rock, the Ramones become the grandfathers, the godfathers, the creators of punk. And that was absolutely true for Bob Marley, et cetera, et cetera. And so it turns out the best companies and the best careers are ones that create or meaningfully reframe categories. You know, my friend Jim Getz at Sequoia Capital here in Silicon Valley, he was rated by Forbes as the number one VC in the world. And he says, if the category exists, we don't want to invest. Wow, so he only wants something that's so new that essentially it has to, it's had to be redefined. Yeah, either, either something that you could consider a completely new category, and I could give you some examples if you like, or a meaningful redesign. You can redesign a category. One of my best friends in the world is a guy named Tim Rode, and Tim was a realtor for years. Realtor is not a new category, but in his geography, which was Manteca, California, he redefined types of realtors. And he, most importantly, because this is what category designers do, they create the market category, thus they play by their own rules. He taught the world to think about the criteria for how you select a realtor as very different. So here's what he does. At the time, all new realtors are told the same thing. The way you build your business is you walk around the community, you get to know people, you offer to do free evaluations of their house, even if they're not interested in listing it right now, et cetera, et cetera. So if and when they're ready, they come to you, blah, blah, blah. And so everybody, like a group of zombies, does exactly what they're taught to do. And that's how they build their business. Timmy goes, that's bullshit. I don't want to spend all my time cultivating relationships with people who might never sell their house. And so he has this very simple aha. I'm going to be the guy for people who want to sell their house now. So if you have a problem called, I need to sell my house now, I want you to call me. And so he comes up with this incredible point of view that he expresses in a tagline. And the tagline goes like this, call Tim Road and start packing. (laughs) And then he does all these It's zany ads on TV where he like bungee jumps. You know, he's in a suit with a briefcase back in the day, right? And he's like, I'm jumping at the chance to sell your house for you. And he jumps off the side of this bridge and he's screaming, call the road and start packing. Oh my God. He's the used car salesman of realtors. He's I'm practically giving him away down here. Jimmy Ford Dodge. Yeah, he had some of that, but he's so hokey and corny and affable that it was cute. It wasn't obnoxious, if you know what I mean. But how's that different from just branding? Why is that a new category versus just branding differences? So branding at its core says, scream your name. Which he literally was doing. Which he literally was doing, right? And it's based on a very old model called reach and frequency. The more people who hear my name and the more often they hear it, the better it is for me. What's happened over time is you and I have gotten very sophisticated at getting things out of our mind. So for example, I don't have kids. So every dollar Chrysler spends marketing the minivan to me is a wasted dollar. I like muscle cars. So every dollar Ford spends marketing Mustangs to me is a good investment because you and I make a decision category first, brand second, because categories are associated with problems that we think are important to solve. So for example, 
you live here in the Bay Area, right? I live here in the Bay Area, correct. Have you noticed over the last, I don't know, five or six, maybe a little longer years, the explosion in quote unquote craft beer? Yeah, I noticed that early, even in New York, there was that, but you're right. Now, if you drink a beer somewhere and it's made anywhere other than, I don't know, in the same bar that you bought it in, you're some kind of tool, right? You have to have it, oh, this was made, I brewed this under the bar where you're drinking right now. You're actually sitting on the hops, on the stool. It's gotta be, it's always, and it's getting so <laughs> ridiculous. Yes, the hops are grown out in the back, which used to be a parking lot right in the asphalt. It's just weird. I mean, there's craft toast now, right, Jason? Oh, yeah, you can get a $12 slice of toast in San Francisco, which is the most ludicrous thing I've ever heard. But I bet that toast tastes good. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It tastes like cardboard. <laughs> they just say for $12, uh, <laughs> you have the sunk cost, and you think, man, I just spent $12 on a piece of toast. This is going to be the greatest piece of toast in my life. And if you have any sense of self-worth, you can eat into that toast and go, this is a crappy piece of toast. They just went down to Jewel and picked me up some toast and gave it to me. And it's $12. And I bought it. So I'm an idiot. If you can't call yourself an idiot, yeah. then, you know, it's the way it goes. Yeah. I think you got to laugh at yourself when you're buying $12 toast. But I... I'm aware that we just got way off your point, but yes, I have noticed craft <laughs> beer okay. and craft coffee, especially, and now craft toast, so yes. And so my point on that is there's an interesting phenomenon now as people try to jump into the category, and we had this happen here. I think there's a law in Santa Cruz that says new craft brewery needs to open every four days, and there was one that opened not far from my house about six or eight months ago, and I noticed something. At the front of the mall where you drive in, they put up a sign that said craft beer. They didn't put up a sign that said art of charm brewery. And so whether they realize it or not, those two dudes, and you just know it was two dudes who opened that place, somehow understood we have to tell people we're in the category that we want them to know we're in. And then we have to build our brand off of that. That is to say, I'm a craft beer called Art of Charm Beer because they intuitively understood that if you scream Art of Charm Beer and I don't know what freaking kind of beer that is, I'm probably not going to pay attention. But if I'm into craft brews and then I get Art of Charm Beer is a good craft brew, now you got me. So what's my point? categories make brands not the other way around and everybody's spending all this time money and energy building their personal brand building their company's brand when in point of fact it's the category that matters and the brand matters a lot too you know i'm a three-time cmo i think i know a little bit about branding but what i am saying is kodak had a legendary brand and still does no one gives a shit because the category's dead right film film cameras now, that's craft photography. We still take <laughs> pictures on film. Oh my God, it's amazing. Where did you even get it? Now you're a hipster. It? Are there ways that people can do this even if they don't own a company? You mentioned personal brand. Can we apply this kind of thing to our personal brand inside our company? Like, let's say I work in a company and I do support and I hate it. Working in support stinks. I'd rather do something else. Can we take this particular concept and stretch it to our career? Absolutely, as a matter of fact, I would assert if you don't, you're going to clip your wings unintentionally. Here's the mistake that most people make. They scream features. Oh, I can do this. I can do that. I'm good at this. I'm fast at that. I you know, made this quota. I did the, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's the equivalent of, of an entrepreneur doing a product demo for people. What makes legendary careers is I get known for solving a big problem that matters in a very unique way. And so what we want to do in our careers is ask ourselves the question, what makes me different as distinct from what makes me better? It's hard to say I'm the best salesperson in the world because even if you are, you're probably not going to be quarter in and quarter out. <laughs> and I've known some legendary salespeople. And so it's about what makes you different because people remember different in a way they don't remember better. Here's a great example. Pepsi spent decades arguing they tasted better than Coke. At the end of the day, when Pepsi says, we're going to do the Pepsi challenge against Coke, at the end of the ad, what do most people remember? Coke. 
And so what I'm saying is legends want others to be compared to them, not them to be compared to others. And that's what sits at the core of different. And when you connect your different to a problem that matters, then you become incredibly valued to people with that problem. And what legendary people do is they evangelize the problem and therefore they get positioned as the perfect person to solve that problem. And whether you're a carpenter or you want to be the next Mark Zuckerberg, that's true. And the mistake we make is we argue we're the best pizza in town as opposed to we're the thin crust pizza in town. Because if I say, hey, boys, let's go for pizza. What do you feel like? Thin crust or deep dish? Or we start to have that conversation and it gets completely differentiated. If you want thin, then you got to go this way. If you want an energy shot, you got to go that way. If you want cubism, go to the guy that invented cubism. A good friend of mine is my accountant, Greg Finley. You know, he's a tax accountant. You know, how do you reinvent, how do you figure out how to position yourself in that category? Well, he's a natural category designer. He said, what problem interests me in taxes? What he gravitated towards was technology executives who had stock options. Because if you were a technology executive with stock options, then you had some complex tax issues that your average run-of-the-mill accountant wasn't going to understand. So he differentiated himself by aligning his skill set with a unique problem. As a result, he was different. And so you only came to him for that. And the mistake that everybody makes is they say, hey, I'm great, and I'm a generalist that can do everything. And legendary people get associated with solving a problem I don't want a doctor who can do everything. What if I don't have a runny nose? If I've got throat cancer, knock on wood, right, that I don't, I don't want a doctor that can pretty much do anything and he's kind of a pediatrician, he'll see any patient. I want the nose guy in North America, right? That's what I want. Yeah, and I think you want the nose gal or guy in North America that has done that throat surgery 10,000 times. Right, knows exactly what he's looking for where it is, she's the best surgeon around for that. Nobody would go anywhere else unless they couldn't afford it, basically. Here's a radical category design idea for individuals and small solopreneurs and businesses. Niche down. Be known for something very small. Because to your point, if I'm the gal who's like the expert on throat cancer on the left side of your throat, you know, two hairs above your collarbone on Thursdays, and that's what you got, then you're who I want. So don't cast a wide net, cast a very specific net, and you'll get better results. And you'll be able to charge more because of the rarity of that particular combination of skills. Exactly. There's this thing that we're trying to manage, which is the gap in the mind of the customer or your employer between their ability to solve the problem on their own and your ability to solve the problem. That's why legends evangelize the problem, not the solution. And when you and I have a medical problem like that, to your point, not only do we want the specialist, but we are going to do everything we can in our power to get to that specialist. That's the kind of powerful differentiation around solving a unique problem in a unique way that leads to a legendary career. That's why we remember Picasso. We don't remember the second. Yeah, I got no other cubists on hand. Right. Peter Tosh is a legendary musician and you could argue a better this and a better that. And guess what? Bob Marley. Muhammad Ali. Everybody says the greatest boxer of all time. Well, he's not the greatest boxer of all time. If you know anything about boxing, he's not the greatest boxer of all time. There's a lot of other guys, you know, maybe even some gals that you would put ahead of him as potentially better boxers. Right. Doesn't matter. His greatest quote, of course, for at least to me, was if I don't tell him the that I'm the greatest, how are they going to know, right? He positioned himself. And so I guess that's really what I'm trying to say, guys, is the legends don't just focus on their skills and their career or their work or their even their brand. What the legends do is they go a step further, which is they teach the world how to think about a problem and a solution in a very unique way and as a result become the leader in solving that. And that might be in a six block radius. If you're my buddy, Hassan, who runs the local market in my neighborhood here in Santa Cruz, and for a six block radius, he's the man. And he's purposely designed a business that is totally in tune with the community. And 
everybody loves the store and the market and him and nobody could touch him. We'll be right back with more from Chris Lockhead after these quick messages. This episode is sponsored in part by TradeStation. So many people are talking about trading, they're day trading and they're trading crypto and they're trading options and they're trading stocks. TradeStation, I get it. When you trade, you get a crazy thrill. You find an amazing trade. With TradeStation, you get that extra edge to inspire your next move because you're only as good as your tools when you're doing the trading thing. Whether you trade on the side or you trade for a living, TradeStation is really smart, easy to use tools that will help you find good trades, learn about how the market works. So whatever your trading style is, they can help you customize that platform to work for you. The TradeStation platform is customizable, which is unusual. Their new freshly designed user interface also helps you navigate really easily. You can spot new opportunities, you can capitalize on them ruthlessly, which is what trading is all about. And it's kind of a masculine space. It's bringing back my Wall Street PTSD. But they've got a new uh, simplified lower pricing as well, which is great. It's gonna be a hell of a lot cheaper than trading in retail. Stocks are only five bucks a trade. Options are 50 cents a contract plus five bucks a trade. And futures are a buck 50 per contract per side. So if you're ready to make your next move, you're interested in trading and you're interested in learning how to do that, take a fresh look at tradestation.com slash charm. This episode is also sponsored by FreshBooks. Staying on top of that admin and paperwork while hustling to grow your freelance business, if that's what you got, is just plain hard sometimes. We use FreshBooks here at AOC. They're down to change all that hard stuff. They've launched an all new version of their ridiculously easy to use cloud accounting software, custom built for the way that you work. Great dashboard, basically says, how's my business doing? No more guessing games on what's owed, what's overdue, whether you're in the red. Jason, you use FreshBooks, right? I use FreshBooks every single day. And in the old days, I used to be that guy that had the Word document that I'd have to duplicate, open up, and then change all the dates and put in the numbers and save it and then send it, try and make a PDF. They couldn't open it, and I never knew if they opened it. With FreshBooks, I know if they opened my invoice and when they did. So when they call me and say, I never saw it, I can say, "Uh, excuse me, yes, you did. Give me my money. Yeah, it's a great program. We've been using it almost since the, man, almost since the beginning of AOC. So if you have any questions whatsoever, FreshBooks, award-winning customer service is amazingly helpful, super friendly, zero attitude, zero you should know how to do this kind of attitude, plus a real live person will usually answer the phone in three rings or less. To claim a 30-day free trial with no credit card required, go to freshbooks.com slash charm and enter the art of charm in How'd You Hear About Us and get started with FreshBooks. Hey guys, by now you've heard me talk a bunch about AOC boot camps and how when it comes to personal transformation, our residential program is where the rubber really meets the road. Now, maybe you're thinking, you know, boot camp sounds awesome, but I've got this stuff covered already. I don't really need to pay for some program to teach me this stuff. I listen to the podcast three times a week. I've been learning the principles on my own for years. And honestly, that's totally cool. We all learn in different ways. But the reason thousands of guys have joined an AOC program is that when it comes to real lasting change, there's just no substitute for live, hands-on personal coaching with our curriculum. Because in our boot camp, the theories and principles you hear on the show get real. Over six days, our team of experts will guide you through field exercises, tailored coaching, and interactive lessons to help you address your unique needs and develop a personal and practical skill set that will last you the rest of your life. So if you've been listening to the show but haven't quite found the dramatic results you hear me talk about, then I wanna hear from you. Drop me a note, jordan at theartofcharm.com or go to theartofcharm.com slash bootcamp and let's talk about why so many listeners have decided to join us here in person. By the way, if you're military or intelligence agency affiliated, check out EliteHumanDynamics.com for more info on those programs that we've designated especially for you. That's EliteHumanDynamics.com. Thanks for listening and supporting The Art of Charm. For a list of all of our amazing sponsors and discounts, visit TheArtOfCharm.com slash advertisers. And now for the conclusion of our interview with Chris Lockhead. How do we niche down? How do we figure this out? How do we design and dominate our own category? Because it's we get it definitely that you've argued this effectively. And we know that every legendary product, every service brand that really crushes this and gets it right does really well. But suppose I'm working for Dropbox, speaking of a storage company, I'm working in support, I don't love it. What do I do right now to make sure that I am not falling into commodity zone? Because this is great stuff for entrepreneurs. Those of us that are entrepreneurs that are listening to this, they'll be smart enough to figure out how to apply this to their business. But I'm far more concerned with people who have a career and are thinking, I'm not starting my own business, but I know this is still important to me and I have no idea how to begin this process. 
Yeah, so if I'm a support rep, there's three questions I start with. What problem do I solve in my job, in my world? What's the real problem that I solve? Number two, what makes me different than everybody in my ability to solve that problem? Different, not better. And the third one is, can you explain it? That is to say, develop a point of view that articulates it. Where's your call Tim Road and start packing? Because the minute he says it, it's a corny line. You may say it's a silly line. But the minute he says that, you understand if you're not serious about selling your house, don't call Tim. Like he has truly differentiated himself with a simple point of view that's expressed in a very simple slogan. And it can be that simple. And so if we get to the root of that, now we know how to proactively position people. And so when somebody says to you, what do I do? You don't say I'm an accountant. You don't say I'm a tax accountant. You say I'm a tax accountant that specializes in helping executives with stock options because they have unique problems. Well, shit, somebody's going to remember that in a way that they're never going to remember accountant or even tax accountant. So we have to figure out what sort of our differentiators are. Do we write these down? I mean, really tell us what we you would do in this person's shoes. Would you write these down? Would you sit down and game plan this? Because sure, it's really easy for us to think about this stuff. What do we do after we've thought about it? And how do we think about it in a way that creates a lasting change? So I'd write down the answers to those three questions. What problem do I solve? What makes me different, not better? And what's my point of view? What's my story? How do I explain it? An exercise you can do sitting sort of alongside this that will make the outcome of that better is this concept of we call them Frodo's to be cute, from twos. So if you take a piece of paper and write from on one side, draw a line down the middle and write two on the other side, and you start to think about everything in the world that you operate in, you're a carpenter, you're a dentist, you're my accountant, Greg. You write down everything in the world that you see today that you don't think is right about being a tax accountant. And you make that the from list. And the to list is the way you do it that's different. And so the minute you can ground yourself in, it is the the way it is now, and here's the way I want it to be. And then you connect your problem that you solve, what makes you different, and your point of view to those Frodo's. Because what you're trying to do is move the category from where it is to the way you want it to be. It's the old story about one salesperson shows up in a country where nobody wears any shoes and they're a shoe salesperson. They look around, they go, there's no category here and they go home and the next shoe salesperson shows up and says, wow, look at the category potential, right? And so what you're trying to do is ground yourself in the way it is today and how you want to move the market category to where you want it to be And then when you go to answer those three questions, you'll be grounded in the change that you want to see around the way people think about you, your differentiation, and ultimately, and this is probably the most important part, the value that you deliver. Great. So with this particular set of skills and exercises, what we can do is figure out how to separate ourselves from the commoditized version of our job. So for a support rep, we're no longer the support rep, just the support rep, I would say, because we have a specific problem that we solve we have a different point of view on that problem, and we evangelize that specific point of view to dominate that particular market. And this reminds me of an example. There was this boat company, a yacht company, and this kid worked in their support department, and what he had found was that their support department was terrible. They had terrible reviews, and the reason was all these rich yacht owners would have engine issues or some problem with their boat. And you know, when wealthy people have a yacht, they could probably get to use it a few weeks a year. They want it to be working, they wanna solve problems quickly. It became a huge issue and their backlog of support was terrible. So what this kid started doing for free was he created a free online forum where he would get back to people very quickly and he had photographs of the issues and he started drawing diagrams about how to find certain things that were tricky to describe over the phone or via their email support. And after a while, he started to charge for his time on this particular forum because it was taking up a large portion of his time. He ended up getting fired by the yacht company for doing this on the side. So what he ended up doing was increasing probably slightly the price for his forum support, and he ended up making something like three or four times his original salary working from home, answering support questions on his new private respond right away forum for rich people in their yachts. And this sort of sounds like what you're describing, right? Because he says, okay, 
there's a problem that I solve, which is that people who own this set of products cannot get support quickly enough. And he was still doing support. He was just doing it better, faster, in a way that they could understand, in a format that they were willing to work with. And he created an, an, a provocative and engaging point of view, maybe not provocative as much as engaging, which was that rich people who bought $3 million yachts should be serviced in a way that feels like the company actually gives a crap. And that was novel enough to separate him from his current company. And then I actually don't know how he would have evangelized this. I would assume he was probably all over places where people were complaining about their particular boat and the problems associated with it and then saying, I'll help you with this, here's a link, just shoot me a note. Instead of saying, I'm great with boat support, he probably said, I can fix this engine problem that you're definitely gonna have at some point this summer. Is that what you're talking about? That's exactly what I'm talking about. It's a great example. Another fun example for me, and you'll have to forgive me because I have completely forgotten her name. My wife, Carrie, and I are the parents of six hens. And we love these chickens, like people who are passionate about their dogs and cats love those pets. So when you become a quote unquote backyard chicken person, all of a sudden you realize there's a body of knowledge that you need that you don't have. Everything from how do you build the coop to how do you take care of them? How do you make sure they don't get killed and eaten? And you know, there's a whole set of things you now need to get competent about. And so you dive into the backyard chicken world. Well, in the backyard chicken world, I have met the category king of backyard chicken advice. And her name is the Chicken Chick. That's her brand. And she is a passionate backyard chicken person. And I think she lives in New Hampshire, somewhere on the East Coast. And she is the Oprah or the Martha Stewart of backyard chickening. And so she proactively took this phenomena that she saw and she positioned herself as an expert, and bam, there she is. She identified kind of this new market category was growing. She figured out that kinds of things that she had to figure out along the way were the same kinds of things everybody else did, and she was just a step ahead, and ba-boom, she rides that wave using digital and social media to become a solopreneur who dominates that market category. So is this stuff more of a mindset than a set of tactics? Because it sounds like, maybe I'm reading into this, maybe this is too meta, but it sounds more like taking control of where you're going with your career, where you're going with your life, rather than reacting to what happens to you. Yeah, very much. And in that context, it is absolutely a mindset. You hear the way people talk, and we do it naturally, and we don't sort of realize the way our speaking informs our thinking. And so you hear stuff like, how's life treating you, Jim? not too bad. And I look at that and go, what the, f what? The, people talk about life like it's the weather, like it's this thing that happens to them. Now, sure, there are some things that happen to us in life, good, bad, and in between, but just the simple idea, you know, when I was a young man at about 17, 18 years old, and I first understood that you could design your life, that was a very big idea. Here's what I've learned. You know, I sort of thought, Jordan, that most people didn't feel like misfits, that most people grew up as kids, went to school, went into the workforce, and they didn't feel like misfits. And for the most part, they found a place in the world. That was not my experience. I had the opposite of that. And as I've gotten older, I've learned that there's a lot of people who feel like misfits like I do. And those people had to make their place in the world because there wasn't a place for them to find, so to speak. And so this approach, it's called category design, to position yourself proactively like this is really about making your place in the world, deciding how you want the world to view you, what your real value is, what a fair exchange of value is, that is to say how much I should get paid for this stuff, and being proactive about designing the kind of career, the kind of life that you want to have. I, I was lucky enough to have a, one of my early mentors, a guy named Bix Bixen on Legends and Losers with me. And Bix said something that has been ringing in my ears ever since. And what he said was that most people and most companies are living inside of other people's thinking. And to me, the interesting thing about that is by definition, Everything we think started off as somebody else's thought that we then took as our own. 
And so the question about all that I have is how much of other people's thoughts are we just playing in our heads and have accepted as our own? And how much do we really think, well, what do I think about this? Because when you start to say, what do I actually think about this? You quickly get on this path called, you know what? I am the designer of my life. Once I understand that I can have my own thoughts, a demarcation point in thinking creates a demarcation point in language, which often leads to a demarcation point in action. And, you know, that's where, whether it's an individual or a company, a real breakthrough in one's life or one's business can happen. Chris, thank you so much for coming on today. This is really enlightening, and I love the idea that we can dominate our own category or create our own category and dominate it. And you did a great job of differentiating why this was not just different marketing or different branding on the same thing, but actual category creation. And I think that's an important perspective because otherwise it just looks like clever marketing that makes people think you're different versus actually being different enough to create your own category. And of course, in Play Bigger, you explain and flesh this out in much more detail with many more examples that we don't have time for here today. But we'll have that book linked in the show notes as well. Well, thanks, Jordan. I got to tell you guys, I don't want to sound overly like a fanboy, but I don't give a shit. I love your show. I love what you've done. The medium of podcasting is so exciting. I was a podcast super consumer for years long before I started Legends and Losers. You guys are absolutely at the top. I love the show. I love the range of things that you do. I love the way your minds work. To say it has been a thrill to be with you guys today is way underplays it. It's been a life thrill. And uh, you guys are uh, the masters. So I bow. Thank you so much. I am so stoked to have been with you guys. Great big thank you to Chris. The book title is Play Bigger. Of course, that'll be linked up in the show notes for this episode. And if you enjoyed this, don't forget to thank Chris on Twitter. We'll have that linked in the show notes as well. And tweet at me your number one takeaway from Chris. I'm at The Art of Charm on Twitter. I'm also on Instagram at Jordan Harbinger. And don't forget, of course, we have a worksheet for today's episode as usual, so you can make sure you solidify your understanding of all the stuff we discussed here today with Chris. That link is in the show notes at theartofcharm.com slash podcast. I also want to encourage you to join us in the AOC challenge. That's all at theartofcharm.com slash challenge. And that's all about improving your networking and your connection skills and inspiring those around you to develop personal and professional relationships with you. It's free, it's unisex, it's minimal time commitment, so no excuses here. It's a fun way to start the ball rolling, it's a fun way to get momentum, and it's a great way to apply the things you're learning on the show here to your life every day. We'll also send you that fundamentals toolbox I mentioned earlier in the show. That all has practical stuff ready to apply right out of the box. Body language, nonverbal communication, attraction and negotiation techniques, networking and influence strategies, persuasion tactics, and everything else we teach here on the show and at our school during our live programs here at The Art of Charm. This will make you a better networker, a better connector, and a better thinker. That's all at theartofcharm.com slash challenge. This episode of AOC was produced by Jason DeFilippo. Jason Sanderson is our audio engineer and editor. Show notes on the website are by Robert Fogarty. Transcriptions by transcriptionoutsourcing.net. And I'm your host, Jordan Harbinger. If you can think of anyone who might benefit from the episode you've just heard, please pay us the highest compliment you can. Pay it forward by sharing this episode with that person. It only takes a moment and great ideas are meant to be shared. So share the show with friends, stay charming, and leave everything and everyone better than you found them. The Art of Charm is supported by CastBox. CastBox is the fastest growing, highest rated podcast app on iOS and Android. CastBox has over 50 million free episodes that more than 10 million users download and listen to wherever and whenever. And now for all AOC family, once you've downloaded the CastBox app, click Go Premium and enter promo code AOC to get six free months of premium features. CastBox is even giving away a free iPhone 10 to one out of every 500 users who register. So head on over to the App Store or the Google Play Store and download CastBox now. And by the way, I love this app. It allows you to search for things inside podcasts. It's a really fast growing app. They're putting a lot of effort and funding into it. It's really looking good. I think it's going to be one of the top ways to listen to any show, especially The Art of Charm. So go grab CastBox, enter promo code AOC under Go Premium, and get those six free months of premium features.